the webinar afterwards to all of you. We will do the same for the presentation. I will download the presentation, including the results on the questions in PDF and send it to you. Um, and if you have asked, if you have questions that, ra that, that come up during the presentation of the experts or maybe already before or during the panel discussion that we will have, please ask them on Menti and we will use them during the discussion. Um, you, because also during the presentation, your microphones and video are, are muted and we will advise you to turn off your camera. Um, but to still make it a little bit interactive, we would really like you to ask your questions in a Mentimeter and actively participate. Um, and thank you, Liv, for uh, sharing the Menti code in the chat. So it's in the chat. So uh, just a very, very short recap on the first webinar. We did the first webinar now approximately one month ago. And the idea of the first webinar was really to give an introduction on e-learning um, by um, experts from Kyran, um, and also to get the student view from uh, Laura, the president of Trinity College Dublin Student Union. And they gave a lot of interesting insights. And this was mainly the most important conclusions we took from that first webinar. Um, so, of course, like online learning fundamentally differs from traditional learning, and it also uh, requires a very different approach. Um, and also, I think very important for now to mention is that also a very important conclusion was that privacy issues, data protection, cheating, etc., during assessment and e-learning were raised a lot in the questions by our participants. And that's also why in this webinar, it will really focus on this kind of things. And the three experts we have uh, asked to join us in the webinar today will also share their expertise uh, on these topics with you. Um, so that brings me to today's webinar. Uh, we do some short introductory questions, uh, the presentations of the experts, a panel discussion led by Liv, and then some closing remarks um, in the end. So please all go to Menti and answer uh, the first question. So quite some people that already uh, took online and online assessments. Okay, there's quite some people that didn't answer yet, but still I'm gonna to go to the next presentation, otherwise we'll be uh, waiting until the end. But this already gives a good insight uh, for our experts as well, like what's the audience they, uh, they are talking to. The next question, um, to what extent do you think e-learning affects the following? Your privacy and data protection, transparency and fairness of the assessments. And it's all on a scale of one to five. So, so far, especially concerns about the transparency. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. There are still some people answering, but still uh, transparency uh, is uh, the most affected, according to you. 
are you willing to make a compromise on the official privacy regulations as a solution to progress your studies during this extraordinary time? It took us quite a while to come up with this question, but we thought it was highly relevant, especially after our preparatory meeting with our experts to ask something like, but given the current situation, are you willing to compromise on the official privacy regulations at this time? Okay, so many of you are actually uh, willing to. Let's see what our speakers will also uh, say about this. Um, last question. Uh, also an issue that um, we heard from a lot of students. How satisfied are you with how your university currently communicates about the assessment? It started very positive, but uh, <laughs> already one question got sent in. Thank you very much. We really encourage you to uh, keep asking questions. But so 2.4, so very uh, hmm, medium. Let's see what our first experts will uh, talk, tell you about this and also uh, address the topics that have been uh, asked already in the questions. I'm going to give the floor to Sylvester Dreyer from the VU University of Amsterdam. Um, and he's going to tell you all about his experience in e-assessment. Sylvester, you have the floor. I will unmute myself, yes. Okay, uh, welcome everybody and thanks uh, for being here and uh, telling a little bit about my experiences and about uh, assessment. Uh, so I work at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and I did all kinds of works into assessment in general and e-assessment in, in particular. So you can read here what I'm, uh, I'm involved with, but if you put up the next slide, uh, then I can continue with my talk. So um, what I think is very important at this point is to talk about assessment in general and not particularly in e-assessment directly. Uh, because there's a lots of terms uh, going on. Uh, people have all kinds of ideas about what assessment is and what assessment is not, what is good assessment or bad assessment. I, I thought I'd give a short introduction into assessment by discussing some terms. So one of many things that is now very uh, commonly discussed is the difference between formative assessment and summative assessment. It's very important to keep in mind when talking about e-assessment. So formative assessment is about it's about low stakes. It's about uh, progressing through your learning by giving feedback and not giving grades, not being the final mark that you get. And that's mostly formative assessment. And we have summative assessment, which is mostly uh, regarded as being high stakes. Uh, mostly these are the exams that we're talking about, but these are also like your thesis that you write or your assignments that you do or your collaborative project that you do. These are summative assessments and they could include formative assessments. So if you do a project, then you have intermediate products or intermediate uh, uh, theses uh, written down. And these are formative assessment because you talk with them, with your tutors, and they help you to improve on your product. Another thing that is important to talk about is, is something like shallow learning or rote learning versus deep learning. Uh, there's uh, always an, an ongoing discussion that, that in higher education, uh, lots of learning is actually shallow learning or rote learning, and we need to move into deep learning. And I want to give a little bit of nuances in this discussion because Deep learning, by definition, is, is, not by, is not by definition projects or essays or problem-based learning or interactive learning. Uh, that, is, that is, in my opinion, only the application of some cognitive or social knowledge and skill to extend in a, the prolonged terms of time. And that's not necessarily deep learning. If I talk about deep learning, it's also involving mastering factual or conceptual knowledge and uh, getting some kind of automation in, in working with all these very complicated cognitive uh, concepts. So if you think about uh, just learning to read or to write in your primary school, these are very basic and also complex factual or knowledgeable or relational and uh, procedural knowledge that you have to acquire, which is very difficult. And that is deep learning, uh, mostly regarded in education. So it's not by definition 
uh, projects or essays. And in, in higher education, it's also being trained and being able to solve really high cognition demonic problems on the, on the time limits. Uh, if you think about mathematics or mechanics or biology or chemistry, you have to do just very complicated stuff with, with your mind. So that's one of the things I want to put forward first. And then if we go to the second slide, or the next slide, uh, the other thing that's very important in higher education is thinking about programmatic assessment. So what each educational program tries to do is to think through their whole bachelor or master program and see, well, what kind and forms of, of assessment should we uh, distribute amongst our uh, learning um, courses and what kind of uh, exams should it be or what kind of assignments and it, it, it's, a, it's a timely mix of formative assessment of summative assessments in many forms like quizzes or assignments or projects or essays and every educational program up to now has already thought about this idea quite a lot and they said well the, the program and the assessment that we have put in place is optimal for this kind of training so uh, that's what I would like to keep in mind when talking about our corona time in which the context has changed a lot and we have to work within this context of already having thought out good programs that have to be changed now. So if we go to the next slide. Um, and another important thing is when we talk about, say, summative assessment, there is always four general important criteria that can be affected when you do it with e-assessment. So I'll run through them very briefly and quickly. So the first... Um, Criteria is that uh, assessment should be valid. You should measure what you want to measure. And it sounds very, uh, very uh, straightforward, but it can be quite complex, actually. They also should be reliable. Uh, so what you want is that, that the assessment measures your achievement in a very precise way. So if you do your, take your exam on day one, and you take the, next ex the, the same exam on day two, and your scores will be very different, then you have a very unreliable exam, actually, or a very unreliable assessment. That is what reliability means in psychometric educational terms. Further, it should be transparent. It must be very clear for students what to expect from an assessment, how you should be pre prepare yourself, how it is conducted, how it is judged or evaluated. That is very important. That's called transparency, actually. And it should also be, that's the fourth one, it should be executable uh, or feasible. Given time constraints and money constraints and all kinds of other constraints, it should be able to execute a, a, a sort of exam. So these are very important to keep in mind. So if you go to the next slide, uh, e-assessment uh, can have an effect on these four main criteria and, and the other things. So uh, it's a very broad term to start with. And I think Rumi will go more in, into deep depth in this, but uh, pencil and paper examinations are already a form of technology enhanced assessment in fact, because paper is a technological thing. Um, also reading answers from scratch cards, if you have like multiple choice questions which you have to scribble on these cards, is also a form of e-assessment or technology enhanced assessment. And if you go all the way to the outer sides of this scale, then you would say, well, the involvement of all kinds of devices and software and additional equipment is something with, to do with technology enhanced assessment. So it's a very broad term. That's what actually what I want to uh, emphasize in this slide. So if we move forward to the next slide, we would say, well, when we put in e-assessment, there is effects on some forms of assessment on these four criteria. So um, with, in terms of validity, uh, with technology-enhanced assessment, it's, it's able to do more real life or close to the intended learning goals uh, assessment. Uh, so you could do, say, uh, questioning instead of multiple choice questioning, for example, or you could have use, students let, use, uh, let them use SPSS when they do an exam, which they should be able to work with or they should be able to collaborate or involve virtual patients. So that's an effect of e-assessment on validity. Uh, the effect on reliability is that some forms of assessments get higher reliability. Uh, there is all kinds of psychometric uh, models and techniques to have a more precise measurement of actual uh, achievement of uh, students. Uh, that's also in e-assessment, and that's a real big field in e-assessment. Um, with unproctored exams, as we go into our discussion, uh, Exams are more prone to teach cheating, for example, and then reliability goes down. So we, have, we cannot make a very valid estimate, a very reliable estimate of the actual uh, attainment of a student. Then transparency, um, with uh, some forms of uh, assessment, it's, it's harder to explain to students what they should do or how they should, should behave or how, how the whole process is, uh, is executed. And we will look into this in more detail, I think, in, with, uh, with online proctoring. And it should also be, uh, executable or feasible, so some forms of e-assessments are uh, more expensive or difficult to, to execute. 
So for example, if you would say, well, we do proctoring, but then we do the live people around who really watch you as you do your exam, just as in a campus-based situation, in which uh, proctors are running around, it's only feasible to, uh, to monitor seven to eight students at the same time. So that's not scalable. Uh, so that you have, therefore you need other techniques uh, to, to put in place to do this. Um, and of course, it should be feasible for students. They should have uh, the, the, the correct equipment. Uh, they should have Wi-Fi, for example, or they should have the correct software. So these are effects of the current time or of, of, of e-assessment on these four main criteria. So if we go to the next slide, and I think I'm at the end of my little presentation, is that uh, there are nowadays also additional uh, conditionals for e-assessment. They were not so relevant, uh, say, 10 years ago, but they're now very relevant given all kinds of laws that have been passed through in the, at the European Parliament. So security is very important. Uh, so uh, and it has a very direct effect on feasibility, for example, uh, because it must be very secure. Data must not get lost or must not get tampered with by all kinds of uh, means. And additionally, we have privacy. So we must make sure that uh, data is collected with a specific goal, uh, with a specific legal basis, with sufficient safeguards that uh, the freedoms and the rights of students are not violated uh, or that they're at least balanced against the goal of what you want to achieve in the legal basis. And you have to do quite a lot of things as an institution to do this. So you have to stick to the general guidelines for, for data processing. And one of the main drivers is data minimalization. You should not collect more information than is needed to make sure that you uh, are in line with the goal. You should have contracts which describe everything that you do. You should have data processing agreements. You should do data product impact assessments. Uh, you should do audits. So uh, given these two additional conditions, uh, our institution are really, really working hard to make sure that we stick within the boundaries that are set by law. So if we go to the final slide, I think, I think that's my final slide. Is there one else? Oh yeah. So. Going a little bit into this, 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 uh, this legal thing, um, so there are possible legal grounds for online proctoring. Thank you very much. I get some coffee from my wife, which is great. Um, so one of the main things that, that people think about is, well, I need to give consent for, for an institution to be able to collect my information. Uh, that is just one of the legal grounds that you can choose. There's also others. And at the moment, at least in the Netherlands, we choose legitimate interest because it's very important that we ensure sufficient study progress from our students, and we cannot get our students into our uh, universities because then that's in violation of other rules that we cannot have students in our universities. So we work with legitimate interest. It doesn't mean that we don't have to think about all the other things because you also have to think about making sure it's secure, making sure that you stick within all the other regulations and guidelines that are set forward within the law. Um, so uh, the, the main thing is at the university and in the Netherlands that they say, well, we first of all try to make sure that we do not need online proctoring, but if we do need it, then we do need it because we need to check who the person is that does the exam and that it's actually the same person that is behind the computer later on, uh, that you can establish that there's no fraud that has been committed or, or a violation of the exam regulations, and that we can make sure that they did it within a given time frame. So these are the main drivers for privacy. And I think now we get to the last slide. Um, so, uh, in our universities, in every communication that we have, we say first try to find alternative methods of examination. But I hope I have explained in the previous slides that we already have very balanced programmatic assessment procedures. So you cannot just change anything just like that. that it's quite hard given all the learning outcomes that you want to achieve, etc. But you should try hard. Uh, second, then show that online proctoring is needed, that you really need to identify person, that you need to make sure they do not commit fraud, and that you need to stick uh, to control the time frame. And then you can opt for online proctoring. So that's the situation at the moment at the view. So I think now I'm ready with my story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, then we move on to the second um, expert presentation. And in the meantime, I'm also oh yeah, um, already unmuted, so uh, ready to start the presentation. I think um, I want to announce to you, Rumiana and she's a professor in educational technology and ICT in the, the Sofia University and was highly involved in the Tesla project. So she will also very much focus her presentation on the Tesla project. Uh, Rumiana, um, hereby I want to give you the floor. Hello everyone, uh, it's a pleasure really to share with all of you uh, my experience and also my concerns 
because it is not only that the students have concerns now when we all move from face to face to online learning and e-assessment, but also the concerns of uh, the staff, academic staff and also institutions. I was uh, for three years and a half a pilot manager of uh, a Tesla project and I'm going to share my experience uh, in this project, which I think will be useful for all of you uh, in terms of uh, maybe we managed to recognize some of the concerns of the students on e-assessment before the coronavirus situation when all of us have to had to move from fully face-to-face -face or blended uh, courses to fully online and now we are approaching a period when e-assessment is going to take place all over Europe including in traditional universities. So the first slide, if I can have, have it on the screen, is just like a metaphor. It just shows, uh, uh, ex expresses one uh, thought of Stanford President John Hennessy in the 2012 when he says that there is a tsunami coming. And its tsunami is an online education which will continue and its growth may slow, but uh, there is not too much, there is too much demand for it not to slow. Um, here I just want to mention that his prediction, uh, the prediction of the president has become a reality in the time of uh, world pandemic of Corona, uh, of COVID-19 and the trend is for e-learning and e-assessment to become even more, more widespread in the coming years as we don't know what the developments will take place uh, in the following years so we have to get used to it and also we have to face uh, a lot of problems and have to try to decide them to the best of all parties involved in the learning process so e-learning and e-assessment offer a variety of opportunities and advantages over the face-to-face -face mode of education but both researchers and practitioners identified a number of challenges related to e-assessment. Learners cheating is one of them. Sorry to talk about that in front of the students, but for many years we do research on this, so I'm going only to share with you factology, uh, what are the re results of this research. Um, yeah, it takes, um, cheating takes uh, many forms. But the most frequent among them are impersonation and plagiarism in e-learning uh, in, and in e-assessment. So um, what are the possible consequences of cheating in, uh, on educational institutions' reputation? We all know that assessment is in the center, the core of education. And through validating knowledge and competencies of learners, uh, learners in an adequate way, um, if we cannot prove that, e-assessment cannot prove that, if that it measures this knowledge and competencies adequately, then this will affect the reputation of educational institutions. And the lack of trust in e-assessment could ruin the public support to educational institutions. Uh, and you all know that they depend very much on it. So the impersonation and plagiarism questions the reliability and credibility of online education. That's why it's uh, in the focus of our attention. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, because of uh, these uh, negative uh, uh, aspects of the assessment, a huge project uh, was funded by the European Commission, which was called Tesla, like the car Tesla. Uh, this project attempts to eliminate or at least to reduce attempted as it finished last year to a great extent the chances of impersonation. Impersonation means that one person can take the exam instead of another person, okay, instead of a student. And plagiarism. So the system was developed to support the prevention and detection of cheating and academic uh, dishonesty as well as promotion of academic integrity. On the next slide, we can see uh, just some data on the project, which is Horizon 2020. You can see the budget, but we are going to move to the next slide. These are just data about the project. It's the Innovation Action Project. And the key objectives of Tesla was to define and develop a software system, which we did, 
to ensure learners' authentication and authorship by integrating in uh, this platform uh, several instruments for students' authentication and, anti and authorship in order for the, this system to uh, be able to provide um, unambiguous proof for learners' academic progression, authorship, and authentication. On the next slide, uh, we can see which were the instruments integrated in Tesla. Two types of instruments, biometric instruments, which collect biometric data from students, face recognition, voice recognition, keystroke dynamics, and text analysis, two types, forensic analysis and plagiarism detection. Okay, so in order for students to uh, be involved in uh, these processes and to use Tesla, they were supposed to sign an informed consent. This is uh, absolutely obligatory. Uh, so they uh, agree to um, provide their personal data. Then they enroll in Tesla depending on the instrument. So they, they uh, either provide face recognition, they take the system takes some pictures or uh, video files or their voice recognition or keystroke stroke dynamics and then each time when they need to complete the assessment activity the system compares the data uh, collected during the assessment activity with the original data of enrollment so we can go further uh, this uh, just um, shows how many students over three pilots in europe took part in the pilots I just have to say that more than 23,000 European students took part in this piloting. We are moving to the next slide. Uh, and this is uh, a map of Europe with the universities. Maybe some of you come from these universities. These are Open University of Netherlands, of UK, Alberta Catalonia in uh, Spain, Javascula University, two Bulgarian University, face-to-face -face university, as well as Anadolu University, with over one million and three hundred thousand students involved in distance education. So, can we move further? Um, the next few slides just show that we involved a lot of students with special educational needs, uh, and we especially studied their opinions on using such authentication system in the assessment we had representatives of all groups of disabilities. Next. So um, all the participants in the pilots were invited to take part in a survey where they were supposed to share their perspectives on several things, among them e-assessment, uh, e-authentication system, plagiarism, etc. So we collected this data uh, from students and staff. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you can see here the number of students and staff, uh, as well as sent students participants in the survey. All they participated in pre-pilot and post-pilot surveys, so we could many could uh, grab, uh, grasp um, their opinions, changing over the pilots. Let's go next. Um, these are the key uh, focuses of our study their perspectives on cheating and plagiarism, pros and cons on the authentication system uh, and Tesla tools, etc. And the following slides uh, generalize uh, uh, the key findings of, the, um, of these surveys. So the student's perspective, we have to uh, pay attention on the few of the findings of this survey. One of them, which is important for me, is that over half of the students participating in this uh, survey um, appreciated the experience with Tesla instruments, although they were supposed to provide personal data. More than 70% of them considered that the key advantages of such systems of e-authentication in e-assessment in e are very positive in order to ensure that the examination results are trusted and to prove that their essays, for example, is their original work. Many students said that the uh, e-authentication would increase the trust in the assessment for students, institutions, and employers. The most popular uh, reasons for, um, for this is that e-authentication would make it more difficult for other students to cheat. So the students uh, really uh, um, recognize that cheating is uh, frequently uh, practice in some of the assessment uh, 
uh, in the assessment uh, uh, re reality. The most popular Tesla instruments, and this is interesting, is anti-plagiarism and forensic analysis, which is text analysis. We uh, managed to identify a quite a negative attitude of students towards pro provision of personal data, such as face images or voice. Although the students share a lot of their face images on Facebook, they are not very willing to provide this in uh, e-assessment environment. So let's move to the next slide. Very, uh, here you can see just quotations from the students. This presentation will be available for you. So you can see pros and cons. All the are all arguments, pros and cons of, um, for using key authentication system. Very similar are the opinions on the next slide, opinions of the uh, academic staff that took part in this survey. Most of them are very positive towards using such type of instruments for students' authentication, as all of them are very concerned about cheating and plagiarism. All of them, most of them, would recommend that their colleagues in other universities to use such systems, and their only concern is the technical aspects of integration of such system in their own university institutional uh, uh, online systems. They also admit and recognize uh, that this kind of system uh, increases uh, to a greatest extent the trust towards e-assessment and reduces cheating and plagiarism judging on their own practice. So if, uh, because I have to finish very soon, um, uh, in order to be in the time limits. Here on the next two slides, you can see uh, send students concern. This is a very special issue when introducing key assessment for students with special educational needs because they also have a lot of problems with accessibility uh, in relation to the te technical aspects of these systems. So they recognize that this type of system, they really appreciate if there is an opportunity to use these types of systems because they provide equal access and opportunity for these students to take exams from home. But on the other hand, they would love to be able to socialize with other students by taking some exams at institutions. It is very difficult to make such a system to satisfy equally the needs of all diverse groups of learners that take part in e-assessment. So to finalize, let's go to more slides and just show you two, more, two of our students that say that such authentication system is a necessity for people with disabilities and for those who have serious justifiable reasons, reasons not to take to attend classes. So since students really feel this type of assessment and this type of system for e-authentication you know, e would really help them and demo um, make education and access more democratic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Lumiana. And I think uh, it led to quite some questions because the questions are popping up in the chat. Uh, then for the third presentation, I would like to give the floor to Naomi. She's a student from the University of Tilburg. Um, and I approached her to take part in this webinar because she start, uh, recently started a petition that is uh, raising the issue of privacy and data protection with the method that the, her university choose for online assessment. So Naomi, you have the floor. Yes. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we can go to the next slide immediately. Um, so, yeah, a short uh, introduction. I am Naomi. I'm 19 years old and I am a first year psychology student at Zurich University. And as some of you may know, I started a petition against uh, online proctoring uh, at our university. So, next slide. <laughs> So yeah, basically the road that led to the petition, um, our university started um, by telling us about uh, their, their, yeah, that they wanted to implement online proctoring um, in their first email that they sent, that was like a few weeks ago, uh, they expressed their doubt about implement, uh, which exam method to implement, either proctoring or an alternative. Um, then uh, a kind of debate started in our study group on WhatsApp, like, 
with multiple concerns, of course, but it was still a bit superficial. It was uh, not yet secure or really known what the university was going to do. So we were just going to let it slide. But then the second email, which was uh, written one day before I uh, made my pet petition, uh, the university mentioned that a pilot was run on the, uh, with Proctorio on a group of law students and that they had really positive results and that proctoring would be the method that would minimize the invasion of privacy um, and at the same time uh, retain a high value of the diploma. So they started to implement it across the entire university. Um, however, the university did not um, debate about this at all with us. They did not ask for our opinion or um, for any alternatives. So there was no discussion um, <clears throat> that, that led from that. They just decided it uh, straight away. Um, yeah, and this is uh, pretty unfortunate because the university seems to encourage critical thinkers, but at the same time doesn't allow such an important topic to be discussed by its students. Um, so yeah, in our um, study group, a deeper debate started in which we seriously talked about our problems such as privacy, but I will talk about that later on the other slide, but also time zone issues because I uh, am doing an international study with a lot of international stu uh, students who are currently in their home country with, um, with different time zones. How are you going to do that? There are a lot of practical issues. What if you have to go to the bathroom? It's urgent. You cannot, you cannot do that. Um, the biggest, one of the biggest concerns also was that there was no alternative offered. So it was just basically you either do this or you get study delay, um, meaning that we have to pay uh, more. And um, so it's basically not even an alternative. It's just a consequence of, of not choosing pro uh, proctoring. Um, and it's also um, a bit excluding to a lot of students who don't have certain factors such as stable Wi-Fi or a laptop even, or a laptop with webcam or microphone. So it's pretty uh, discriminating even when you think about it that a lot of students don't have, these, uh, don't have this equipment and the university has not reached out to us about what happens to those students, you know? So uh, multiple students already sent their concerns to the university per email, um, but the response that the university gave was very superficial, very, standard like we we understand your concerns but we assure you that everything's handled perfectly but never the university the university never mentioned specific actions that it that it took and uh, a specific plan of action it was just very very uh, standard so um i decided to start a petition because um, i thought change was not going to happen with a single email um, but first i had to do some research especially on the privacy part so yeah um our biggest uh, concern is privacy because a lot of data is saved during the exam. We can also see that on, um, on the picture. That's the beginning, uh, the start screen of Proctorio uh, when you're about to take the exam with the software. Um, you will see uh, at the bottom, you will see all the data that is collected and it's actually insane how much um, is uh, collected. And also um, if your network, uh, if your Wi-Fi um, drops out, uh, during the middle of the exam, you're just done with your exam and then you've studied a month and a half for your exam for, yeah, for nothing. So um, a lot of uncertainty about that. Um, also a lot of uncertainty about how our data is handled. Um, um, if, uh, earlier on, Sylvester talked about transparency and about how important transparency is. Um, and I agree with that totally, but um, it's not shown here at our university. It's not transparent at all. There are a lot of questions. How is our data handled? How long is it safe for? How is innocence proven? When uh, we are suspected of fraud, there's very limited information. Um, also, there are many, uh, many uh, investigations and research done about proctoring and about Proctorio, the software specifically. And it also says that, for example, according to SERP, data leaks do not have to be mentioned. So if our data is, um, is, is leaked, uh, we, we would not know about that. And also it's uncertain how our privacy uh, or how our data will be handled. Will it go to the Netherlands? Will it stay in the Netherlands? Or will it go to the United States? Because Proctorio is an American uh, company. So, and in the United States, there are, very, there are other privacy laws um, than in the Netherlands. So then you have that problem. 
Um, also, the National Student Union uh, and the Dutch Data Protection Authority um, have raised their uh, concerns about privacy as well. So, um, it's good to know that they're also uh, working on it. So, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, yeah, then uh, the petition was started. It was started um, um, after the second email that the university sent. Um, it is not a petition to stop taking online exams at all, That not, not at all, because also I'm like the biggest nerd you will ever see. I, I love learning and studying and taking exams also, but not this way. So this petition was really created to raise our concerns and also to express more awareness about other possibilities and other possible exam methods that have also been implemented by other universities around the world. Um, such as open book exams, take home exams and essay writing. And these, uh, these methods have even been implemented in studies that are bigger in mind. And um, even Tilburg Law School has decided to uh, implement alternatives as I will talk about later. So it is, it is possible. And furthermore, it's gotten a lot of media attention and also political attention as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's become big in a very uh, limited time. And then next, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so what steps have been taken so far and what has happened so far? So um, I think uh, two weeks ago or a week ago, the petition has been officially sent to, to the university when it reached 4,000 signatures. But unfortunately, we have received no response yet in any way, so that's too bad. Um, furthermore, the email has been sent to the data protection officer of the university and an official complaint has also been implemented with um, also consisting with a list with, uh, of other concerns and questions, practical as well as legal. Um, in the meantime, we've, have, uh, we've had our first victory. Um, Tilburg Law School is completely proctoring free. Um, so they've implemented alternatives for every um, study in the Tilburg Law School. Other studies are still um, unclear. I've heard some stories about other studies that they've also switched to alternatives but um, not a lot of studies um, I know yet, also not about mine. Um, yeah, we've also explored other perspectives. So other than the media, we um, started exploring a bit uh, with the legal perspective and a political perspective. And we are also in contact with various organizations that represent the students' interests and have a specialization in privacy law. Um, it's still ongoing, so I can't mention um, more about that right now. Um, yeah, so um, last week we received an update by the university that um, they still want to implement Proctorio when it's absolutely necessary, but the update was very similar to the one before. Um, and the only thing that's extra mentioned is that uh, it's decided per faculty and an opt-out is offered for those that do not want to participate in proctoring exams. So an alternative is offered and that's a great improvement. Um, until, until now, it's still unclear uh, in what way we will have exams. I've uh, sent the uh, university an email yesterday, but I've received no response yet. Um, and a lot of new petitions around the world have actually been started, and I think I might have been an inspiration in that, but of course I'm not sure. But I've also been uh, receiving a lot of messages from students around the world who have started their own petition, so that's great to see that students are standing up for themselves. <clears throat> I think that was my last slide. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank okay. you so much, Naomi. Yeah, and I wanted to say, Liv, um, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for all your valuable input and all the different perspectives that you already covered in your input presentation. Now we are switching um, to a small panel discussion in the rest of this uh, webinar. So all the participants of this webinar are now encouraged to um, still post questions on Menti so I can take them into account. Uh, when doing the panel discussion, Nina will also open them so you can all also see the questions of the others and also up and downvote them. So I know which kind of questions you are interested in. Um, I would like to start with uh, one topic that I heard about across all of your presentations, which is the, the topic of communication. So how important communication is between universities, between students and staff to make e-learning and e, 
uh, assessment possible and um, valid and reliable. So from Naomi's presentation, I already heard that one of your major concerns was that there was no communication, that your point of view wasn't taken into account and that there was also no alternative offer. So I would like to ask one question to Sylvester. So as a, from your perspective or from your experience, which role does communication between all the different stakeholders in e-assessment play and make it work and make it functional? Uh, well, the first thing I would like to emphasize is that it's, it's a really a very, very complicated uh, operation to get a system that you haven't had in your university up and running within a matter of weeks. Um, so you have to work with teachers, you have to work with support, you have to work with students, you have to work with uh, official student bodies like the, the student council, the faculty councils, you have to work with the exam barge, you have to work with the technicians. So it's a really, really complex project to get something going like this at the scale that we're now facing. So that's, that's phase one. So in my project that we do, I do only communication. My whole day is full with all kinds of meetings with all these kinds of bodies to make sure that everybody knows where we're heading, how we should take care of this and what, not, what needs to be done. That doesn't mean that we reach our students in a very satisfactory way. So the first line of communication that we have in our university and most universities is through the official student bodies. Uh, we have official lines of communications with them through our uh, the boards of, uh, of uh, governors of our universities. So we communicate with them quite a lot. And we often can only communicate why to our student population when we have made sure that we're in line with our the uh, Medezeggenschapsraad. I'm not quite sure the Dutch the English word for it is. Uh, so there's, there's always a lag in communicating to the wider student audience about your, what you're really doing. So indeed, it is very important, but it's also very complex because of all these parties that are involved. But I can imagine that for the regular student, like Naomi, for example, it seems like there's no communication maybe at all. Uh, so that's what I can say at this moment. But to, 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 to add to this, to illustrate this, we're, we're bringing up uh, a new website for our university uh, tomorrow. And so we, we collected around about 50 uh, frequently asked questions. And they have all to deal with all these kinds of little things that people might want to know about this whole online proctoring process. And it's just because it's very, very new that there's not a sort of a cultural perspective on how these things run, as is the case in campus-based um, education. So we students don't ask themselves, well, what do these uh, proctors actually do in our campus-based university? Uh, but now we go to a situation with technology, then at a certain point, well, well, what do these people actually do? Do they do a good job and do they don't talk about what they see on the video with, with people just around the corner? Uh, whilst in the campus-based situation, they could also do this, but then we don't ask questions about it. So yes, communication is very important, but also very complicated. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to um, continue with this kind of topic of communication to you, Naomi. So in the last slide, so what you already reached your, with your peti um, petition was that you could introduce alternative formats for students who really um, don't want to participate in e-assessment. And this is like in line with one of the questions that a participant raised about um, equity and also discrimination against students that might not want to pay, uh, take part in uh, e-assessment. So which kind of reactions from students did you already get for the success of your petition? Uh, I've received a lot of support actually. Um, also students are really happy that there is now an opt-out even though we don't know the specifics yet. Um, it's still good to know that the university is thinking about those who don't want to uh, take, yeah, take um, or what do you say, engage in uh, online proctoring. Um, it's also very uh, motivating to see that um, other faculties of the university are slowly switching to alternatives. So that gives them hope as well. So uh, let's just hope that our faculty also comes up with something soon, because even though they are hopeful, they are still a bit um, scared even because the university has not, uh, yeah, has not emailed us about anything yet. So. Yeah, it's a bit double. It's the email again. Yeah, yeah. right. So long <laughs> the communication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. A more technical question that was uh, upvoted by the participant is now visible on the screen. And I would like to um, ask this question to Rumiana. So the question is, if facial recognition seems to be the most intrusive type of proctoring, and it could be affected by skin color, headscarf, etc. 
Um, if you could say something about this, how could this be uh, taken into account in the forensic analysis? Mm. Okay, let me see if I ah. Okay, uh, yes, uh, face recognition uh, or facial recognition uh, software uh, requires a lot of uh, taking a lot of pictures, uh, series of pictures in order to make sure that different changes, this is one of the students' concerns, that if they put glasses or they change their hair, uh, etc., this can affect uh, uh, the comparison between uh, uh, facial, facial recognition uh, performed in one exam to the previous uh, pictures, but the system works in a way that uh, it compares the pictures and in case there is any doubt that the student who took the exam is the same student, then they send a record of this series of pictures to the teacher and the teacher can judge uh, on whether this is the same person or not. So it's not the system that uh, can say whether it's cheating or not. Um, uh, facial recognition is uh, very intrusive because it appears that the students who don't like providing this type of data for, for their personal reasons. What is um, forensic analysis about? This is a software developed by a Mexican company. It was uh, part of the, uh, of the project. In fact, they do linguistic analysis, uh, do analysis of the style of writing of the particular student. Uh, this is type of technology that is um, uh, now very much under development. Uh, so it's more like qualitative analysis of the style of typing. Uh, uh, that's why this, uh, this instrument is uh, between biometric data and text analysis data. Uh, I hope this type of uh, uh, software will um, be much more widely uh, used in the future when it is uh, further developed. Uh, but at the moment, uh, the students find typing, typing text, uh, sending essays uh, um, much less intrusive uh, than providing data like voice and, uh, and face. But Can in I fact, add something to this maybe? Yeah. Um, I want to emphasize what Rumi says that if we put in systems like this in place, it's never a computer who decides that students commit fraud or something. There's also very strict regulations, at least in universities in the Netherlands, that there's always human intervention in, in legal terms. So that's really live uh, surveillance at the university who do the regular surveillance also on campus-based situation, who actually do interpretation of images. The computer only helps a little bit to to support them and do their work effectively and, and, and fast. So there's never a, a decision made by the computer. And if we talk about facial recognition, which is really very important, the system that, that we use, and, and Tilburg also, I know, they don't actually know who is behind the computer. They only know that there is a person uh, conducting in some kind of way in which they, they, they look at eyes and the nose and the mouth or something to know where, where this person is. So for example, if you want the computer to know whether the student is still behind the computer, then, then it needs these little points to see, well, is there something in view or not? And then it only flags to say, well, the, the person, I don't know who the person is, the computer says, but the person that I'm now trying to follow is not behind the computer. And of course, to prevent cheating, it's very important that you know that students don't run off and get, get their answers some, somewhere. And then it's still up to the surveillance to, to really estimate, well, what's going on there actually? So we know the person left the camera, but maybe something happened, uh, the, a door slammed shut because of the wind and he closed it again and then the surveillance can say, oh, nothing, nothing wrong, we can just continue as usual. So that's actually what I really want to emphasize. Computer doesn't decide anything, it's just a, just a help. Yeah, sure. Can I add just something to address one of the issues pri of privacy and data protection? We know that students are very much worried about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also we know that it is not a matter of, it's not possible for a month or two to arrange the data protection agreement between universities and uh, pr providers of this uh, authentication software solution. So uh, the, the it's a matter of transparency, yes. The policy of the university and their decision should be transparent in order for students to be sure that their, their personal data is, is uh, going to be processed in a secure way. But I, I wouldn't believe that any university, European university, 
would not check from the legal point of view how this data is going to be processed and uh, uh, saved uh, and used in the future. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe, maybe I can add to this. In, in, the, in the Netherlands situation, we do not go into uh, work with, with the companies if we don't have signed a data protection agreement which is exactly described how they uh, store their data, where it is stored, how they secure it, who has access to it. So that's, that's everything we do. And it's possible within a time frame that we're working now to, to do this actually. And, and we do this, otherwise we couldn't do it. So I, I yeah. really want to emphasize that we really do this at our university. Yeah, the legal authorities would not uh, allow this system to be put in place. In, uh, if you don't have these agreements. Yeah, sure. And one last thing, um, and it's my just to add to what Na, some of the Naomi concerns and also suggestions. Yes, of course, the students should have an alternative. They should be able to take the exam from home if they wish under certain circumstances, and they are introduced to these circumstances in advance. Um, and also, some of the students may choose to uh, go to the university and take the exam uh, face to face. Um, but we shouldn't encourage students uh, to use the assessment because this really allows for much more flexibility. You should know that there are students that have and want to work and to study from home and they want to take exams from home. So uh, unfortunately, these issues were very well known among students from distance uh, universities and uh, blended universities. And now they become clear for other students face to face but this is just a current situation, this an emergency situation. And we universities, we have to uh, uh, finish, to uh, allow students to finish successfully their studies this semester. And we cannot organize signing data sharing agreement in frame of one or two weeks. So we are also on your side, but we try to provide you opportunities for you to graduate, to take your exam. So we have to be more, uh, to be able to make compromises because of the situation. Of course, in the future, uh, the things will change uh, more smoothly, uh, both, both in the direction of e-learning, key assessment, and yeah. universities will go back to face-to-face, -to -face, yeah. who wants. But now we have to resolve this, and our yeah. students want to graduate. I, I want to emphasize that we do not compromise, actually. To be, to be really honest, we do not compromise. Uh, so what we try to make sure is that students can progress through their studies as smoothly as possible. We take every precaution that is required by law to make sure that your data is protected really, really very good. Um, and we simply cannot have groups of students come into our universities because there's other regulations say, well, you cannot do this. Um, and there's also always the option for a student not to take part in, 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 a, in an exam, of course. Um, but given the situation as it is now, it's up to the student to decide to do so. Yeah, so um, I would like to give the floor also to Naomi, as you already gave your two perspectives. Mm -hmm. So uh, Naomi, tell me a little bit more about how you see these issues from your student perspective point, and also maybe mention the alternatives that your university also offers you right now after your petition. Yeah, so um, I understand and like all of the students understand that it's of course a really big uh, issue and that all of you are working really hard on it um, behind the scenes, but um, I feel like it wouldn't be that much uh, extra effort to just send a short email once in a while to our students with an update of what's going on, you know, because we are just here sitting day after day, like, when are we going to mm -hmm. hear something? When are we going to hear something? And, you know, and that's, that's the transparency part that you're talking about. Um, it's so important that, that you don't hold information about us that could also be valuable to us, you know? And also, I understand that it's, uh, it's really a short time, limited period. But then I'm also asking myself, how did other universities then manage to do it? And how did other universities with even a, a greater amount of students than the studies that we're talking about, how did they manage to do it? So I would be, I would be really interested in like, you know, is the university maybe in contact with the other universities? So are they discussing with each other what's going on? So those are like, yeah, questions that, that arise in me. Okay. <clears throat> As we are running quite uh, quite short on on the time of this webinar, 
I would like to use the last uh, minutes to sum a little bit up what we discussed in this webinar, what you gave us as uh, input from your presentation and also what are the main outcomes of this uh, last panel discussion. So what I learned from your presentation that the concerns are not only on the student side, but they are also concerns from the staff side, from the university side, from the administration side. And like e-assessment is kind of a double-sided coin. Um, so it can give great opportunities to students with special needs um, that want to take um, exams or uh, assessments in a more time and space uh, independent manner. But also even though it's now an emergency situation, one should be careful with the data protection. That of was um, especially raised from uh, Naomi. And in all of this um, e-assessment discussion, one of the major points is communication that I heard from you, that transparency can help a lot, both for students and for staff to understand the situation. Uh, where are you right now? And where is this path of e-assessment going? Um, and also within this communication, um, what I also learned from you is, two very important topics, which are that there should be alternatives for, for students to choose from in case they do not agree. And also um, that they are included in discussions. So not only respond to a final outcome of policies within universities, but also actively participate to fulfill their role also as active citizens um, at universities. Yeah. So I think these are all like we cannot have like a final uh, <laughs> final one sentence remark yeah. as this topic is so complex and complicated and has so many facets. Mm -hmm. But I think we already touched upon so many important points and I hope we gave some interesting viewpoints to all of the participants uh, and also to reflect on this a little further after this webinar. And for all the participants, um, thank you for joining. Um, we will make this presentation and also the video available afterwards. So um, you can go through the slides again uh, and have a look um, for the information that you still want to look up. And also if you want to have more information on the experts project, you can find the links in their presentation or the buzzwords that you can look for in the search engine. So I would like to close the session by thanking our experts for um, participating and joining us in this webinar. It was a pleasure to have you and get your inputs in this. Thank you very, very much. And then one thing to add um, is that the next webinar will be on the 19th of May, uh, same time, 2 p.m. CET and it will focus on the quality assurance of online learning. And we hope to uh, see you all there. <laughs> and with that, that, I would like to end the webinar. <laughs>